This is Anastasia De Santos at USAID. Um, can you all hear me now? Okay, great. Uh, welcome to our MarketLink seminar um, as part of our ongoing series on private sector development. Today's ecosystem forum on building social capital links to an existing practitioner conversation that uh, my colleague Kristen Oplanik and also Mike Ducker at JE Austin have been convening. From USAID's perspective, uh, we know uh, based on work by the Innovation for Poverty Action that growing small and medium enterprises, uh, growing the human capital of those entrepreneurs is very important, but it's not simple. The technical assistance interventions can work well, but you need to customize them and you cannot have a one-size-fits-all approach. As a donor, you say it is really interested in cost-effective solutions, which I expect we're going to hear about today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Abby. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Abby Davidson. I'm a research analyst with the Axon Network of Development Entrepreneurs. And I'm going to moderate this uh, very interesting ecosystem forum on building social capital today. So to set the scene, growth-oriented entrepreneurs around the world need various types of support in order to grow, and we commonly discuss financial capital. But social capital is necessary as well in order to make connections to potential investors, but also to meet potential customers, suppliers, partners, advisors, and more. In addition, mentoring relationships are crucial to help entrepreneurs navigate the professional and personal challenges they face. So that's the context for this conversation today. And to bring some insight to the topic, we're going to hear from various perspectives on the role that social capital plays in a high growth entrepreneur's journey, touching specifically on why social capital is important for high growth entrepreneurs, how entrepreneur support programs can build social capital, and then how that capital can be leveraged to improve the success of entrepreneurs. And we'll focus mostly around both mentorship and peer networks. So we have a panel of <coughs> practitioners that have extensive experience working with uh, entrepreneurs and can speak to this topic from various perspectives. And I'll introduce them one by one. We have Rob Tashima, Director of Billcap Innovations at Village Capital. Village Capital is a global seed stage fund that finds, trains, and invests in entrepreneurs working to solve real world problems from health to agriculture to clean energy. We also have Kathleen Burry, CEO of Mowgli Mentoring a not-for-profit driving inclusive economic and social change in the Middle East and Africa through mentoring experiences that inspire, connect, and guide entrepreneurs and leaders to overcome life's personal and business challenges. And then last but not least, we have Mike Decker, Director of Entrepreneurship Programs for JE Austin Associates, which assists organizations around the world to improve productivity, enhance competitiveness, and facilitate economic development. So uh, now that we are familiar with everyone in the room, we are going to get started with short presentations from each of our panelists. And as we go, I just encourage you to ask questions via the chat box, because um, I'd love to see some of your questions, uh, especially if we get into our conversation at the end. So I believe we're starting with Mike. <laughs> Take us away. Uh, Thanks, Abby. Um, uh, as Abby said, I'm Mike Ducker from the JE Austin. We're the ones who um, helped, I guess, found this ecosystem forum. Really, the goal was to create a, 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 a voice and, and a place to connect organizations that are helping entrepreneurs in emerging markets. Um, I think we're, we're slowly, as a group, learning how we can effectively doing this. Um, but I think there's still a lot of mysteries and how we can effectively help entrepreneurs. And we developed sort of the forum to be a place where we can bring in people of lessons, both good and bad, and what they can share. And the topic of social capital is one that I'm really, really passionate about and, and really wanted to do for a long time. And, and I thank um, Anastasia from USAID and Market Links and you, Abby, with Andy and all the data you guys provide through the Gali, and, and of course you, Rob, with Village Capital, which I I think are way ahead in many organizations as we help entrepreneurs here. And of course, of course, um, Kat at Mowgli, who is just, they, I've learned a lot from, from them and what they're doing. Um, I, I don't consider myself an expert on this. I kind of consider myself a student of um, social capital 
And, and I thought I'd just talk about sort of my journey as a student. Maybe I'm a second year master's student in, the, in this topic. Um, really, my, my, my story starts in Egypt right after the revolution. Um, I worked on a, on a USAID program that was supporting entrepreneurs. Um, and just a couple of months after the revolution, we were fortunate enough to uh, be able to help a group of people that were doing the first startup weekend in Egypt. I think the second in the region. And, and literally, just literally, I saw magic. It just hit me over the head, where I just saw people, some of the most successful business people, not just in Egypt, but in the region, were helping these young people trying to start up their companies. Um, and you could see the energy being generated by the engagement of people talking and helping and supporting and challenging each other. and and. And I'm sure more of other people have seen this and have experienced it. But from then on, I'm like, there's something here, and I want to understand it better. And, you know, I'll, and, and so most of the programming, or some of the best programming and support that we did in USAID and Egypt was really how can we get people who've been successful in business, who've been successful entrepreneurs, they become mentors, could be champions of the ecosystem or investors. I mean, a lot of what we were trying to do is really try to not just grow sort of the programmatic institutional part, but really a lot of the social part. How can we get that out there? Um, and so that's where my sort of journey began, and, and I was very fortunate to, to be part of that. And, you know, um, there's been a lot written about Egypt and the success, and even that startup weekend, we had uh, founders that are continuing their companies that have got funded by uh, Silicon Valley um, venture capitalists. Uh, and are doing very well to this date. Um, after I got back from Egypt, I, I'm actually from Detroit. Um, I wanted to, I had some time on my hand and I kind of became obsessed with how did the auto industry start? How did this thing really just sort of ignite? You know, why, why Detroit? And so I, I spent, I'd say four or five months just studying the founders of the major automotive companies, their investors, and really the domain knowledge that they were trying to obtain uh, during that process. And, and this is before, we remember, before venture capital, before accelerators, before incubators. This is really about people connecting with people. And, and there's a couple lessons that I, that I got from doing this research. Um, one was there was like an industry evolution. Um, uh, Michigan, like so many other places, was, was, had a lot of natural resources, especially in timber. Um, that timber led to a skilled workforce that was able to do work in, in, in manufacturing of wood. Um, that led to um, Flint, Michigan actually becoming the center of the carriage industry in, in the state and in the country. Um, the largest uh, company that actually produced carriages was founded by a guy named Billy Durant. And he is actually the founder of General Motors, which became the largest company uh, automotive company and company in America at one point. Um, so we saw this progression of domain knowledge um, over industries. The second thing is once this industry started to really create momentum, we saw outside domain knowledge come in. So people like uh, uh, Henry Leland, who was from Pennsylvania, he came from the, the gun manufacturing industry. And if you remember your history, uh, of Eli Whitley, you would remember that uh, gun manufacturing is sort of where we became, where we were able to develop the manufacturing process of creating replicable parts, and that was able to help us scale operations. And so that knowledge was brought into the automotive industry. There were people like Henry Leland, who first started to produce transmissions for Oldsmobile, um, was asked by Henry Ford's first investors to look at a company Henry Ford gave up on. Uh, he turned that company into Cadillac. Cadillac was then purchased by General Motors. Uh, Henry Leland let, then left and created another company called Lincoln, which is then purchased by Ford. So you see all these people connecting, investors, suppliers, employees, working on manufacturing and engineering issues uh, and operational and finance issues. It was just an incredible number of people connecting on so many different domains um, that produce in a historical economic growth that has never been seen in our country uh, to this date. We are talking about an industry that went from 12,000 people employed to four, over 420,000 people employed in 20 years. 
Not, I've never seen anything like that in the United States. You would have to look at a country like China and electronics to see an industry and a geography that's been impacted so much. Those people made increased their incomes by three times, productivity increased by five times, um, and the investors made out. The original investors of the Ford Motor Company made 34x time their original investment. Rob, would you like to make that kind of investment? <laughs> I mean, those are better than most Silicon Valley deals. Um, and, and since that time, we've seen other more sophisticated organizations take this type of research and really, instead of looking at institutionals, looking at people. And, and, I, and I point to Endeavor Insight, which has just been really doing, I think, some of the top work on some of this research, really trying to identify what I would call champions in an ecosystem Companies that are driving, people, I shouldn't say companies, people that are driving entrepreneurs. And this is a, a map of, of New York City, and the big dots represent really just uh, entrepreneurs who are, who are generating other entrepreneurs, either through employment, um, through mentorship, or an investment. Um, these, these champions are, are a major driver of what I've seen in other uh, ecosystems. Uh, of, of entrepreneurs, so it's really at the personal level. And because of Endeavor and, and um, Endeavor Insights Research and also um, the startup genome, we've seen not only uh, the connections, but we've seen the results. Um, according to both these organizations, um, people who connect to other entre successful entrepreneurs are, are more likely to grow their, their revenue and also more, more likely to get investments. So we've, we've seen the data on this. And I personally use this data to promote how you should help entrepreneurs. To me, this was always the core in all the programming that I've supported. Um, you know, so over the last five or six years, we've been in um, about 20 different countries helping to build up you know, entrepreneurial ecosystems. And our focus has been how can we really get, again, the private sector, successful business people um, to help these new entrepreneurs out there. Um, and, and even with the World Bank, uh, we were able to um, come up with ways to, to do that in a systematic approach. And I have to thank um, Kat because she gave us a lot of insights of what Mowgli does, of how to recruit potential mentors, how to connect them with entrepreneurs, how to manage such programs. There's really, uh, you know, really thought process that really needs to happen um, through that process, program. But since that time, and more recently, um, you know, I've seen other data. The World Bank has also confirmed impacts of mentoring on entrepreneurs. And I've seen some um, recent data from a university in um, South Africa that actually showed that uh, mentors are actually transferring information and knowledge to entrepreneurs. At the same time, um, I started to see some things that were not so positive. And, and, and really, it's, it's Abby and, and the research they're doing at Andy with the GAWI that really, you know, clued me in on this, that we're really, you know, we're really starting to see maybe some mentoring programs are not having the impact of the entrepreneurs that we expected. And I have seen individual uh, surveys um, from specific entrepreneurship programs where the entrepreneurs were not happy with the mentorship. And when I saw this, I just had to take pause. Here I have been being an advocate and a promoter and thinking that this is what we need to do and build a social capital, and then we're seeing some data points where we're saying maybe this is not the answer, uh, or maybe there's issues that we're not addressing. And so that's why I thought this would be a great idea to bring really people much smarter than me, like Rob and Kat and Abby and others, to help maybe identify how we can make sure that this works. Um, I think there are some, you know, I have some personal um, views. I mean, just one point I think, uh, and then I'll just hand it over, is I think there's just a conflict of expectations. Um, entrepreneurs are thinking about today. Um, they want their problem solved today. Um, I was just at, uh, at mentoring some teams up. I, I, I volunteer mentor at the Accelerator up in Baltimore, and we we're, we're I was working with a team that does one of these things where you know it's leveraging a group of independent contractors um, through its platform so they can make business, and they wanted to know how to do that in a quality way. They want a very specific domain knowledge that I didn't have. 
Um, but I find most entrepreneurs are, are thinking about their, their issues of today. And, you know, and the problem is entrepreneurs are always going to have issues. They're always going to have problems. And I find that mentoring is not always about helping them solve their issues. It's helping them think about how to solve their issues. On the mentor's pro issues, I think sometimes <coughs> they think about it, it's about them. And the reason I say that is because I've been that mentor. I've been that mentor who thinks, well, I'm going to solve these entrepreneurs' problems, and then I'm going to brag about how smart I am. I, I've been that person. Um, and I don't know if I'm helping their problems or not, but it's really about me making myself feel good. And I've heard lots of mentors complain about, you know, I tell the, the entrepreneur they should do this, and they don't do this, and I'm not sure why. And so the entrepreneur, or the mentors, I should say, think that the entrepreneur should just listen to all the advice they give them. Because again, they think it's about them and it's not about them. Um, so um, I, I think there's you know, a, a real need um, to help sort of ensure that the expectations of the mentors and the entrepreneurs are, are, are on the same boat with a lot of these programs. But I think this is just one of you know, several different issues that are out there. Um, but I'm sure some people who are smarter than me can help address some of these things. Thanks, Abby. Great. Thank you, Mike. Next is Kathleen, who's going to talk about Mowgli mentoring and what she learned. Um, take it away. Great. Thank you. And, and thanks, Mike, for that backdrop. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone, from whichever time zone you're in. Um, so Mowgli has been driving inclusive economic and social change across the Middle East, North Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa um, through what we call 360-degree mentoring. And we've now delivered over about 110 mentoring programs in 17 countries, whereby we've trained over 1,150 mentors and supported over 850 mentees. And I'll come on a little bit later in terms of um, sort of what our program model looks like. Um, but I thought it was interesting just first to look at why did, you know, why did we specifically, um, you know, focus on mentoring. And it really was due to the stark reality of what was happening in the Middle East um, and North Africa back in the early 2000s, where unemployment, um, mass migration, and population growth statistics were being thrown at us from all different angles, um, and some of them quite astounding that one couldn't even get their minds um, around. Um, you know, the Middle East and North Africa has an unemployment rate, which is the, one of the highest in the world at 17, sorry, 11.7%, of which over 28% of that is youth, um, which is just staggering. Um, in terms of the migration, we've seen over the past few years the migration from uh, the Middle East uh, and North Africa into Europe. Um, and the World Bank, you know, came out with the statistics and the prediction that 60 to 80 million possible refugees um, globally by 2026, of which a large portion of them would be from the regions that I'm talking about. And then if you look at population growth, um, Middle East and Africa are expected to have 3.4 billion people, which is more than China and India combined by 2050. And when we were looking at how could we even start to tackle this, you know, sustainable entrepreneurship, you know, came to to show to be a very long-term and viable solution to address these challenges. But what we found and, and what we believe is that an entrepreneur needs to have a supportive and a balanced ecosystem around them. And we see this as being four key pillars. The first is around an enabling infrastructure, which includes incubators, accelerators, utilities, um, etc. An enabling environment, which includes parenting, schools, role models, peer networks, access to finance in all of its forms, and then finally human capital. And we've actually split human capital into two different um, sort of legs. The first is the business skills training, and the second is mentoring and support networks. And we, the reason why we've done this is that, you know, we, we've realized through the, sort of the last decade that we've been operating that we really need to catalyze the much needed entrepreneurial growth um, through human capital development, which actually focuses on both the capability and the capacity. And so we see it like this diagram here is, is actually two legs of a person. The capability is very much focused around the skills, the knowledge, and the behaviors. 
and the capacity is focused around the confidence, the motivation to keep going and to get back up when, when things knock us down, the mindset and the resilience so that we can start to address and overcome our fear of failure. But how can we do this? Well, mentoring actually, in terms of our sort of philosophy of 360-degree mentoring, enables us to focus on both the capability and the capacity. And we use Tim Galway's um, equation from the book, The Inner Game, which is potential minus interference equals success. The interference can be split into two different areas. There's the external interference, and then there's the internal. And the external is all around, how can I do something? Where can I get something? What do I do if this happens? And generally, one can ask a colleague, a parent, a friend, Google, or even at a conference, these questions, because there's no real self-identity and um, emotion attached to those questions. It's the internal interference where this now changes. And this is where the fears, the limiting beliefs, the insecurities, and the psychological factors that um, people you know, take on, driven by gender, race, culture, society. And it's through having a mentoring relationship, which actually provides a safe space and a trusted space to actually identify, explore, reflect, and then choose how to move forward with these internal interferences so that we can actually turn one's potential into success. And so given this, our definition um, which really creates the basis for our accredited mentoring syllabus is that a mentoring relationship is a long-term trust-based relationship. It's one where the mentor and the mentee focus on both the professional and the personal aspects of the mentee, and hence why we call it a 360-degree mentoring. It's where one is able to address both the external and the internal interferences and focus on the capability and the capacity. It's empowerment focus rather than advisory, and that's how it somewhat differs from business mentoring. It's voluntary, it's relational, it's non-transactional. So all of our 1,150 mentors that we've trained to date have not been paid for their services and are not able actually to receive any payment from the mentee for that either, because it really does change the nature of that relationship. And another key aspect is that it's a it needs to be a two-way value throw through mutual learning. Otherwise, one of the parties will start potentially to get bored or feel frustrated. Um, and so we always try to ensure that there's that in place. And as a result of that definition, our mentoring programs focus on sort of five key, five key areas. The first is around raising awareness about mentoring and its importance. Um, we've worked in a in predominantly emerging markets where mentoring is not really commonplace. Um, the word mentoring today, if you go into a conference or you look at entrepreneurship, it, it's mentioned in, in every sort of piece of literature, but in some of the countries we've worked in, mentoring is not understood, it's not known, and it's often confused with business mentoring, training, consulting, advisory, coaching, therapy, counseling all of these different things that come under that sort of human capital development umbrella. And so really what we have found is it's really important to raise awareness about what mentoring is in conjunction with all of those other um, offerings, and also what is, what is the importance of them, what are the benefits that one can get from looking for a mentor themselves or becoming a mentor themselves so that we can actually then um, you know, enable them to catalyze their own growth. And this really leads through to a key aspect um, of what we have found to be one of the success factors of mentoring, which is the recruitment of the mentor. And I think uh, Mike sort of alluded to a couple of things um, on that, especially around sort of the expectations. And I think the key word for me would actually be intent as well, um, which I'll, I'll come back to a little bit later. Um, the second key area is mentor training and capacity building. So within our program, we take people who are business professionals, who match a certain criteria that actually is fit for the program. All of our programs are, are tailored to the needs um, and the objectives of the funder, but also the needs of the beneficiaries going through the program. And so the criteria set and the business professionals are recruited against that criteria. 
And what we do is we train them in the art, the skill, and the mindset of personal mentoring. So that what they're able to do is also learn how to create this safe space, this, this beginning part of this trust-based relationship. Um, and we capacity build them thereafter for a minimum period of six months, but often a year. And I liken mentoring to a language in the sense that one can learn the grammar, one can learn the sentence structures, the vocabulary. But if you don't have the confidence to actually practice the language, we're not really going to get, you're not going to be able to get the ROI on all of the time that's been invested in learning that language if you don't have that confidence to speak it. And so what we're really doing through the capacity building is actually building the mentor's confidence, skills, knowledge, behaviors, um, as well as the sort of the motivation as well to keep um, supporting the, the, the mentee. The third key area is around the matching. Um, and because we are looking to create long-term trust-based relationships, our matching doesn't focus on a CV. Our matching focuses on chemistry and connection. Um, and the reason for this is that we believe if you're trying to create this trust-based relationship, if you don't like that person sitting in front of you, the likelihood of you opening up about those fears, those insecurities and limiting beliefs is going to be minimal. And therefore, we, we, we try to ensure that everybody is actually matched when, with somebody who has that connection in the group. And what is interesting is um, a number of our entrepreneurs have now come to describe it as the Mowgli magic in terms of how um, our facilitators actually run that process. Um, and if we look at the statistics, it's over 80% of our relationships um, continue on beyond the program, which really, for me, is a testament to that, to that um, human-centric um, element of the process. Um, the fourth area is the one-to-one -one structured support and guidance that we provide. Um, we mentor, you know, mentorship, mentoring relationships are often quite scary for people. They, people feel quite daunted. They don't really know what it means, how to operate it, how to start it. Um, and it can be quite daunting. And so what we provide are the tools and the support to remove the fears, the doubts, and the insecurities. And we provide the accountability um, and the capacity building support to enable the setting of those relationships and then the best outcome of those relationships in the long term. And then through this process as well is where we come to the fifth area, which is the peer-to-peer -peer network uh, building side, which is done through our programs as part of cohorts but also um, you know, across the Mowgli network, which is across the 17 countries. And what this has done is enabled us to achieve quite significant levels of um, impact. And we actually look at impact in three different areas. For us, it all starts with the personal growth and the strengthening of leadership. And if we look at the numbers, um, you know, 90% develop confidence in their decision making. 71 were able to overcome and, and work on their fear of failure. And that 62% improved confidence in actually achieving a healthier work-life balance. And we, we believe that if we can strengthen the leadership and the leader within that entrepreneur, it will then lead to greater levels of business growth, sustainability, and success. And Mowgli, within Mowgli, we tend to focus on entrepreneurs who are within what we call the valley of death, which are the pre-breakthrough. Um, entrepreneurs. And so when we look at the statistics of 92% of businesses remained operational um, and 71 feel more confident to move their business forward, um, for us that's a real testament to the power of mentoring um, because that's where most businesses break down. And then through that business growth, it then leads to the economic growth and that job creation and retention side that we um, track as our key, our sort of key end goal. And our entrepreneurs, on average, have created 3.1 jobs um, within the mentoring, within the year that they are with us um, as part of that structured mentoring program. 95% of existing jobs were retained by the entrepreneurs. And we also looked in terms of economic um, contribution that $25 million were created to the economies only through job salaries, not through the revenues of the businesses or any other means. And Sorry, go to the next slide. Um, and by focusing, um, you know, so, so in order for us to actually achieve that, we've worked with a number of funders which have been listed here. Um, and really what we've done 
in partnership with them is, is prove or disprove how mentoring has an impact on those three areas um, that I just mentioned. And, um, and so what I'd like to do is actually, before I pass it on to Rob, is actually ask you to think about how 360 mentoring could enhance your own programmatic activities, but also you as an individual and your own growth and maybe your organization's growth as well. Thanks, Abby. Thanks so much, Kat. Um, so now we're going to hear from Rob uh, Tashima from the Village Capital perspective and the accelerator side of things. Thanks, Abby. And uh, big thanks to, to Mike and Kat as well for uh, really kind of framing this in, in such an effective way. Uh, I, I would agree with everything that's already been said, um, to be honest, it, what um, Mike and Kat have said around the kind of uh, centrality of human capital in terms of uh, supporting or the potential to support better outcomes for entrepreneurs but the fact that it can also go wrong in terms of um, expectation management, uh, I think is a really kind of critical piece to understand. And sort of where we're slotting into this is uh, on a component that Kat flagged up, which is that peer-to-peer -peer network and the importance of that. Um, so I think probably what makes the most sense um, is for me to talk a little bit about Village Capital's perspective and approach to this before I kind of dig into where we plug into social capital for entrepreneurs um, in various markets. So Village Capital's you know, general thesis is um, ultimately that entrepreneurs can have an impact on some of the biggest problems that we as a world face. Um, but to actually do that effectively, we need a diversity of perspectives. Now, this isn't diversity for diversity's sake, but um, it's to ensure that we are having a holistic approach to solving critical issues in things like healthcare or education or agriculture. And to do that effectively, we need to make sure that there are people who have lived experiences of those problems, for example, who are weighing in, um, who are uh, able to take a look at a problem from a variety of different uh, sides. Now, when we look at the ability of companies to address these major problems, things like climate change and so forth, uh, obviously venture capital funding is uh, one key indicator of companies who in the future will really help determine the direction of those problems, of our economy writ large. So funding really kind of determines the future and venture capital really helps determine who will become big. But we're not seeing an effective allocation of venture capital right now in terms of addressing those problems. If you take a look at uh, unicorn companies, which are companies that are valued at a uh, billion dollars or more, the same amount of companies are tackling uh, consumer goods issues as are tackling health, education, and agricultural issues combined. So what this ultimately means is that as far as venture capital goes, there's a, there's a real kind of disproportionate allocation as far as uh, funding goes and support goes and, and which entrepreneurs are actually able to access the resources that they need to scale. And ultimately that's a result of the fact that venture capital goes to a certain group of people who look a certain way, who live in a certain place, and who are solving uh, certain types of issues that venture capital investors uh, can relate to. So I'll just give you a quick example of this um, with the company that we've worked with previously, which is um, a company called Piggy Bank, based in Nigeria. So Piggy Bank is a female co-founded uh, startup which looks to help improve the financial resiliency of uh, young Nigerians. Uh, by giving them opportunities to generate wealth, to, to save money, um, and to essentially uh, prepare for the future. Now, the problem is, uh, first off, that there are uh, a number of obstacles <coughs> that Piggy Bank uh, needs to overcome to actually access the resources uh, it needs to scale. The first is the fact that it's in the wrong place, so it's in Nigeria. 
And 50% of venture capital globally goes to just three cities in the U.S. That's San Francisco, Boston, and New York, which means if you're outside of those cities, the ability to access venture capital is uh, pretty limited. The second obstacle that Piggy Bank needs to overcome is the fact that it's female co-founded, which as a result, um, if you take a look at the, the average benchmark for uh, who gets venture capital uh, writ large, women founded companies make up 2% of the total allocation of venture capital globally. They make up about 15% um, when you take into account mixed gender teams. So that's a second obstacle that Piggy Bank needs to overcome. The third obstacle is the fact that Piggy Bank is trying to improve the financial well-being of young Nigerians, which is not a problem that the majority of venture capital investors uh, can really relate to. And you can see that when you, again, take a look at um, unicorns, uh, there's about 18% of the um, current unicorns who are able to uh, address issues like health, food, education, uh, financial inclusion, and housing. So that obviously um, leads to a lot of issues in terms of the ability of entrepreneurs to scale. Um, you know, we often hear that entrepreneurs, uh, good entrepreneurs are everywhere, good ideas are everywhere, um, but access to capital and access to resources are not. And uh, I should probably also apologize because I'm lagging in terms of um, going through the slide deck, so <laughs> I often have this issue. Um, so bear with me. Um, but starting about uh, Ten years ago, the co-founders of Village Capital um, had this thought. Uh, so Ross Baird and Victoria Fram, who uh, came up with Village Capital, thought that is, is there a way that we can effectively change the power dynamics in the venture capital space? Can we actually have an entrepreneurs evaluate each other and conduct due diligence on each other on behalf of investors. And essentially, this is based on um, kind of the village banking model. So the, the general structure of it is bringing together a group of, let's say, a dozen entrepreneurs into a cohort, all of whom are working in a similar geography and in a similar space, and uh, essentially taking a deep dive into one another's companies to assess the potential of those companies and their peers to scale. Um, to provide uh, an ROI for investors and to assess their business models. And so we've been doing this, again, for about a decade, um, and we've seen some very encouraging outcomes from that. Um, ultimately, the peer review and the peer selection process, which our fund has used to make all of its uh, investment decisions, um, has yielded a portfolio with uh, over 100 companies that is 44% female uh, founded or co-founded compared to about 15% on average. That is catalytic. So for nearly half of all companies, uh, we are the first invent uh, investors going in. And for 85% um, of those companies, they are, um, they are outside of the Silicon Valley, um, Boston, New York space. So we know that the outcomes uh, play out really well, um, but we still for a long time weren't entirely sure about why that happens and to what extent the peer review process is actually playing a role in terms of increasing diversity, in terms of yielding commercial success. There's obviously a lot of other factors that go into these peer selection programs that we run. Um, there's a curation and selection process at the beginning. There's obviously facilitation throughout the programs. Um, so there's a lot of other variables that we had to account for. Um, and we had a massive data set to dig through as well. So we've run in total about 70 programs. We've worked with um, over 1,000 entrepreneurs. Uh, we've made 100 investments, um, but still didn't really have a good sense of the whys uh, in this peer review process. So working with the MacArthur Foundation and the Enterprise Database Project at um, Galley, uh, we took a look at trying to answer two questions. So one is, can entrepreneurs make successful uh, investment decisions? And two, can they do so in a way that mitigates uh, the gender bias that pervades VCC and increases diversity? So happily, the answers to that are yes. So what we found digging into this um, was ultimately that entrepreneurs are able to effectively evaluate uh, 
uh, their peers' ability to scale and to provide a good ROI um, in a way that mitigates uh, traditional gender bias. So ultimately, we see more inclusive investment through peer evaluation and peer due diligence that does not sacrifice commercial objectives. And it's really kind of impressive when you dig into this, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but ultimately, even after as short as four days with one another, the entrepreneurs are able to uh, get a strong sense in a statistically significant way of which companies will be able to raise the most capital in up to two years after a program. So, I mean, just after four days, these entrepreneurs can already get a sense of, of who's, who's on an upward trajectory and who's not. And that plays out throughout um, the cohort. So it's not only uh, that entrepreneurs are able to assess which companies might perform better, but also which ones might face more challenges moving forward, which is really kind of critical because one of the key, um, key components of, of any successful entrepreneurship journey, obviously, is not only the ability to scale and succeed, but also the ability to fail and fail quickly. Um, so this also um, is an effective process for evaluating that. And critically in terms of the uh, gender component, we also see that female founders are uh, evaluated on the basis of uh, their commercial merit of their companies, um, which ultimately uh, is, again, unique in the venture capital space. So we see that as female founders come into the peer selection and peer review process, um, their peers, male and female, take a look and evaluate their potential for scale and ROI based on their underlying fundamentals of their business and not based on their gender. And why that's unique is because if you take a look at how venture capital uh, is traditionally uh, deployed uh, by investment committees to male teams and female teams, you'll notice that um, male founders are often asked questions about the opportunities of their business and um, sort of generally assumed to have a good understanding of their sector. Female founders are often questioned on the risks of their business um, and questioned on the fundamental understandings of the sector. So ultimately, uh, the peer review process helps to, to mitigate that. Um, and really, I think, excitingly, from our perspective, also kind of brings out some really uh, interesting um, other points which we're looking to dig into uh, further this year, but one of which is the fact that um, while Peer, the peer selection process works really effectively as far as capital uh, raising goes in terms of the peers' ability to evaluate <laughs> the potential of one another to raise um, additional funding rounds later down the line. They're less successful uh, at ter in terms of evaluating the potential of them to generate revenue. So um, one of the things that we're trying to take a look at is, is that a result of um, kind of broader trends in the venture capital space where this emphasis on equity uh, investment leads to a devaluation of female founders in large part because female founders face a more difficult uh, task in terms of raising uh, funding from outside equity investors later down the line. So there's obviously still a number of questions to dig into, um, but we know that, again, we've seen good outcomes from uh, digging into uh, the peer selection process as far as our portfolio goes, and we know that it does have a positive impact in terms of mitigating gender bias. There are still a lot of questions um, that have yet to be asked, but as to whether social capital can play a role in supporting entrepreneurs, from our perspective, uh, it certainly can, especially in this peer-to-peer -peer space. And with that, I'll wrap it up. Great. I have a presentation as well, <laughs> Gabby again, um, but I'll try to keep it quick. I just wanted to bring some of the uh, research perspective um, to compliment Rob that he showed um, about, you know, what I've learned about social capital given my experience with Andy. And um, I am not a, an expert on social capital at all, but I come from, you know, two perspectives within Andy. First is the Global Accelerator Learning Initiative, with which both Mike and Rob have mentioned already. We are a partnership with Emory University to collect data on early stage entrepreneurs that are applying to accelerator programs. We have data on over 19,000 early stage ventures now and have produced a plethora of research reports. So in that, we've tried to learn what is working in acceleration and some of those questions about social capital and um, networking have come up quite a bit. So I'll 
touch on that. And then also, just quickly, this Small and Growing Business Evidence Fund, where we are partnering with the International Growth Center to look at all the existing evidence on how business support programs can best help uh, early stage entrepreneurs grow, and also then identifying the gaps in the research and funding some collaborations between researchers and practitioners to fill those gaps. So I'll touch on what we've learned from our literature. <laughs> I have two main takeaways from what I've learned through these projects regarding social capital. Uh, the first is that peer learning is consistently tied to venture growth. And the second is that the evidence on mentorship is just less clear. I think there's a lot of anecdotal evidence on how effective mentorship can be, but coming from a data perspective, we've seen more struggles to identify exactly what the impact of mentorship is and even how to define mentorship. So first I just wanted to show this figure, which is from Galley. When we collect data from entrepreneurs, we do so at the time of their application to an accelerator program. And we ask, what are the benefits you're expecting to receive through participating in this program? And then from that, we looked at what did each entrepreneur rank, rank at their top benefit? And so what you're seeing here is how often uh, entrepreneurs ranked each type of benefit as most important. And so here we already see social capital is very important to entrepreneurs. Number one is network development. Number three is mentorship from business experts. But interestingly, we see uh, this peer learning, peer networking piece, which we call gaining access to a group of like-minded entrepreneurs, was ranked as a priority least often among entrepreneurs. But uh, flipping this around, we also asked programs, uh, accelerator programs, what benefits they think are most important that they offer to entrepreneurs. So just flipping that question around. And here we see that this peer learning aspect is actually seen most commonly as the top benefit uh, that accelerators provide to their entrepreneurs. And then taking that a step further, we compared the higher versus lower performing programs within our sample, and we saw that the higher performing programs are actually more likely to list gaining access to like-minded entrepreneurs as a key benefit. So there's something there um, <coughs> that's leading entrepreneur to greater entrepreneur success, at least among the accelerator programs. And then just shifting to mentorship, um, we in this same report where we compared higher and lower performing programs, we looked at several quantitative measures of mentorship, uh, including number of mentors, mentor backgrounds, and amount of time spent with mentors, and found no significant differences between higher and lower performing programs when it comes to these metrics around mentorship. Um, and when we, we took this information to interviews with accelerator programs and asked, you know, is, is this because you don't feel like mentorship is, is actually important for your program, or, or what's going on here? And the answer we consistently got is that mentorship is important. It's just hard to capture through standardized data like that. And just some of the quotes that they're in from these interviews are that, you know, mentorship abilities of experts vary considerably regardless of their background. Um, relevant expertise doesn't necessarily translate into an ability to effectively impart that information. And that the matchmaking part is very important and takes careful consideration. And then just to cap it with that, what the academic research has said about these two topics, and um, this is that literature view that I spoke of in the beginning. For peer learning, what we saw from the academic research is that peer learning improves performance among firms of various sizes. And there's clear evidence for that, specifically from this one study about firms in China and seeing how they learned best from peers who were running similar businesses, but yet were slightly more advanced. So, and another key part of that is that they were not in direct competition with one another. And then for mentorship, we kind of have mixed evidence. There are two main studies we pulled from. There was one on virtual mentorship in Uganda, which led business leaders to pivot their model, like 
um, some sort of adjustment in, in what they were offering, but not necessarily, that didn't necessarily translate into increased profits. And then mentorship for microenterprises in Kenya was another study, and we saw that there were impacts on profits in the short term, but they didn't necessarily translate to the long term. So there's clearly something going on with mentorship, but we don't yet have enough evidence to, to say, again, specifically, you know, that it works especially well and that it, um, you know, this is the best way to provide mentorship services. So just wanted to add my two cents there, but we are going to transition into some questions. I prepared some questions for our panelists, and we also have some questions that have come in from the audience. Thank you so much for submitting those. So I think we should start with mentorship. Um, and we'll start with you, Kat, being the expert here. Um, on this question of whether you can sort of manufacture or automate mentorship. And what I mean about when I say that is oftentimes when I've interviewed, you know, accelerator program managers or mentors or others, they talk about how it's important to find the right personal connection between the entrepreneur and the mentor. And it, it, it can be difficult to figure out how to best make that happen. So since you run an organization that is devoted to making all these mentorship relationships happen in a systematic way, how did you how do you actually think that that's possible? And like what's the secret to that? Yeah, no, thanks, Abby. And um, it's a tough question. Um, it, and so the, sort of the way that we tackle it is is really looking at who do we recruit onto the program. And I think this speaks to what Mike was saying earlier. Um, you know, we we want to recruit onto our programs the people who really want to mentor and have the right intent to mentor, and then those who are actually mentorable. Um, you know, we, we actually have found over the years, for instance, speaking on the entrepreneur side, that the level of ego that we're seeing within the entrepreneur space is actually increasing. And therefore, the mentorability um, is, is something that we really have to be a little bit more astute on um, in, in terms of um, you know, looking at through our recruitment process. But I think the key, in terms of how do we enable, give the best chances for these mentoring relationships to sort of take form, I think the first thing starts with the, the recruitment. Um, the second is having the alignment around the expectations and alignment around what is this mentoring relationship really going to um, potentially give and what could you potentially receive from it um, you know most entrepreneurs come into our programs and typically they want access to finance they want someone to do um, their business plan for them and or they want um, the contact database of the mentor to be opened up to them and so we do spend quite a bit of time actually you know sort of giving them an exploratory opportunity to actually understand what is mentoring for them and how could they really take advantage of um, of, of the program. Um, I think the, the, the third key area would actually be around the training of the mentors um, because the, um, you know, one of the key elements and some of the questions that are coming through is, you know, how, what is the benefit for a mentor coming into a program and, and yes, it's about giving back, it's um, sometimes learning about a new industry, but I think one of the key things that our mentors come into the program for is that they're, they're being trained and capacity built um, in, in skills which they can take into other areas of their life, their work, their communities. Um, and, and it's part of leadership development for them. Um, and so they've already got you know, the opportunity to have value off the, from the, from the, from the get-go, which they then can sort of you know, provide um, to the mentee throughout that relationship. I think the matching is another key point in terms of how do we give the best chances for this, these relationships to form, it's, it's that human centricity around the matching. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, how does one take that online? And so we're actually in the process of doing two things. One is um, taking our mentor training syllabus that is very much a face-to-face -face program at the minute and building um, an online mentor training program to test if it's if we're able to get the same quality levels of mental training through a technology solution. And the second is, is actually to see how can we do an online mental matching 
uh, mentor mentee matching um, process and see how, you know, prove or disprove, does that give us better relationships? What does it have a, in terms of um, impact on the impact um, and, and see where that takes us? Um, and then I think the final bit is that support. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, people find it really difficult going into mentoring relationships. They don't even know how to start that first conversation. And so what we do is we provide the guidance for the initial conversations to take place so they can start to build those relationships. And then we just see them fly. Um, and, and typically, you know, most of our relationships um, will continue for the duration and then pass the duration of the actual mentoring program. Uh, let me just add on to what, what Kat said. I mean, we're talking about manufacturing relationships, and it's uh, incredibly difficult. And we're talking about people with different personalities. That is really incredibly <laughs> difficult, I think, for an algorithm to sort of capture and figure out how to match. And I often think about the matching like dating. You know, do you have like um, these these dating sites which you know take all your personalities and other things and somehow find your perfect partner? You know, I, I guess there are sites out there, or, you know, does it take, you know, maybe traditionally what happens for many of us, you know, there's a, there's a relationship and, it's in a, and there's a subtlety of trust that grows over time through different interactions. And I, I think what programs have a difficulty is, is putting the, the, the time the relation The trust. the bill. Because it
you know, For me, the, the, the entrepreneurs really, they, they size you up pretty quickly. Do I trust this person? Can they help me? Are they in it for the right reasons? And and that just takes time, I think. And I find a lot of programs, they just don't want to put in the time to really build up the, the trust in the relationships. And I also, the programs I've talked to, I find the ones that have somehow let the, the participants pick each other in a, um, I don't want to call it self-selection, you know, but they had some the say in the selection really process of, hey, Sort of you know, the people I met, these um, are the three people I think that I, I connected with. Learning, the um, both both sides, the mentors and the entrepreneurs. The I find I mean, those of types of programs so have had, beginning, you know, more higher surveys of, of the relationship, like it's been more positive. And it was only when then I if the, to the entrepreneurship so program says, you know, I'm the matchmaker and you two are the mentor and the entrepreneur and make this work. I find those are less successful in, you know, my engagement types of programs. Different you know, it, it, I mean, I don't know how the the side. traditional um, matchmakers sort of do their business, but, I, you know, it's, it's a difficult process, and for me, it's like um, letting letting country, people be people and connecting, so instance, you know, sort of naturally, of doing of, you know, how in, that might happen. Um, and and oftentimes, it's not based on sector or industry or expertise. It's, time, it's just they can really relate understood. somehow. Um, you know, there's other reasons that people connect, you know, for Jordan. And a number of the mentors actually yeah, right. set up. Uh, there's to, another question about <coughs> to you know, set there's up some research into what that motivates They understood now how things um, work um, on the, the ground um, and, and really learned through the um, entrepreneurs from anywhere on that. And, and actually, Rob was very and, like, you um, didn't talk a lot trials about and tribulations about how to really you know, get something off the ground in Syria. Unfortunately, that as well. given we what's happened, like they've not been able to yeah. turn that into reality, but they really have did leverage that opportunity to understand a different ecosystem. Yeah, different that's a really good question. Um, I mean, mentorship, um, outside mentorship, not peer mentorship, is We now, as part of our programs, we don't only focus on entrepreneurs, we also focus on women. Um, I mean, like and Mike leaders. and Kat have both said, it's a really tricky thing, and uh, you know, by and large, we like to think that we get it right, but it does require a lot of uh, forethought into um, the resources that they bring, the skills that they bring, how they communicate those skills, um, and then what the entrepreneurs are looking for. So there's a lot of kind of pre-planning and pre-prep um, around identifying the needs and the assets of both. The, the entrepreneurs as well as the mentors because the mentors, as um, both Mike and Kat have flagged up, the mentors also have needs and they're looking for something as well. Um, and so essentially kind of getting to what Mike touched on in his first presentation uh, and Kat doubled down on is um, making sure that there's alignment in terms of the expectations is really crucial. Um, but when you actually see uh, that kind of matchmaking come together, it really is kind of an incredible thing. Um, the, the sort of um, mind meld between an entrepreneur and, uh, and a mentor and the, the benefits that both get in a genuinely productive and constructive relationship is really incredible. Uh, but it is a tricky thing yeah, and it requires a lot, of, uh, a lot of planning and forethought and really being very explicit about what the needs of the entrepreneur are. You know, are they looking for introductions? Are they looking for um, to raise capital? Or do they need help around reducing their customer acquisition costs or improving their unit economics? And what can that mentor provide? Can they actually provide substantive input around that? Can they help them think differently about that? Yeah, and, and Kat, to you, I'm curious, now that you've worked with so many different mentors, you know, have you been able to only actually any research, you know, I'm sure you've, you've been able to compile a lot of data on what's working, and have you have you been able to do any research or find any outside research on what does motivate 
a volunteer mentor. Great. I've gotten a couple questions about to what degree gender and cultural differences impact entrepreneur mentor relationships. And if any of you have witnessed, you know, discriminatory discriminatory perceptions or bias, and if that's impacted the mentorship process. So I'll leave that open to anyone who wants to, to chime in. That's a very good question. I'll just say quickly, I mean I mean um it, it is a, a difficult question, especially when this has become a lot more open. And you know, and I think there there is some issues I see in with entrepreneurship programs. Um, you know, I, I've seen programs yes, that sort of promote sort of a Sorry, party atmosphere and feel, which I think okay, some so I women, think, you know, that are night and so, okay. just drinking, and, it, it, and, and for some people, they probably um, don't so feel comfortable we, uh, in that type measure, of I mean, Silicon Valley impact. startups. You know, uh, party scene type us, atmosphere. You know, key, um, so you know um, I think there. Um, from the I think it also presents an opportunity stage, where I think programs can think a little bit more um, aggressively the on the communities they want to bring together. Um, because I think we're we're talking about different. Uh, and, uh, um, and networks people have, and we're trying to leverage those networks and try to tap, tap into them. And and I think programs that try to, to break down uh, those cultural barriers have a real opportunity um, to give people who might not have the network uh, to tap into some of those high-level uh, business yeah. connections previously. And I mean, I think, um, you know, aggressive uh, uh, programs, and I think it sounds like Village Capital is, is absolutely one of them, will try to break down these barriers to prevent this, these biases based on our community <laughs> and who we hang out with and connect with. And and yeah, and just kind of spinning off of what uh, Mike was saying, I think the, the mentor selection bias or the discrimination inherent or otherwise, um, yeah, that is a really challenging question, and, uh, and to be perfectly honest, we don't have an answer for um, to what extent that affects uh, mentorship, and, uh, and more importantly, to what extent 
that and affects the, the outcomes that the entrepreneurs see. And that's um, actually something that we're going to be so digging into over the course of 2019. We're doing some we're research in collaboration with the IFC um, around specifically the gender component of that. Um, that, which uh, I think, again, really the research that we did last year with the MacArthur Foundation and, and Galley was really illustrative in terms of um, telling so, us how yeah. peers engage with one another and, and peer mentorship and peer interaction um, can mitigate mm -hmm. that gender bias, but taking a look at external mentors is, is something else. And um, I know that was that question was also linked with um, the question about financing bias. Um, I mean, that is also that is endemic in the venture capital space, and I, you know, obviously, societies at large. The again, what we found is that with uh, having a group of entrepreneurs <coughs> do a deep dive into one another's businesses in a very structured fashion. Um, so the the kind of framework that we use for peers to conduct that peer review, peer selection process is very sort of rigid, um, very transparent, and we've uh, included. Z scores uh, to help um, address things like gaming the system, um, that can ultimately uh, help address some of the bias in the financing component. Um, but, you know, it, and this ties into another question that somebody had, um, you know, how do we know if that's actually working or not? And that's really where um, Abby's crew at, at Galley comes in. Um, they, Galley, who we've worked with since, since really they got up and running, uh, is focused on really assessing the, the outcomes and the values that these entrepreneur support programs provide, um, whether it's you know in terms of emphasizing mentorship or in terms of emphasizing investment readiness or, or other things. Um, and they do this longitudinal data tracking for up to two years after a program, which is obviously very resource intensive, but they've done a great job of it now. And um, I mean, we've used their data sets a lot, thousands of data points around um, you know how effective entrepreneurs see these programs, how the performance um, plays out post-program in terms of the, the commercial uh, success of their business, um, all of which is really important, tying back to that original question of, of um, how, how effective mentors are in terms, and social capital is in terms of um, supporting entrepreneurs. Great. Some other interesting questions that have come in are around metrics. How do you actually measure mentorship outcomes? And how do you assess effectiveness in terms of the experiences of the mentee as well? Like there's sort of the quantitative measures that I'm extra interested in. But then also, especially with these questions of, of bias, how do you get everyone's perspective? Um, well, keep that open to anyone. I, I mean, go ahead, Kat. No, you go ahead. <laughs>
I mean, Abby, this is probably a really good question for you because you're the you're the data expert here. <laughs> but it's interesting. I see so many programs they they um, hone in on things like lean startup or growth. Um, type um, programming, which are da very data focused programming for the entrepreneurs, but they, they themselves are not very data focused. <laughs> so this is a, even a bigger issue than just around sort of their networks and capturing their communities. It's really, um, they, they're not really looking at their own data and I think sometimes even afraid to look what's underneath the hood. Um, and it's great that Dali and some other international benchmarks are going out there and helping them sort of collect and think about this data. Um, but what I've, I've seen out there is for the better programs, um, they are doing surveys of the entrepreneurs and the mentors to kind of see, one, if the specific mentors they're working with are happy or not. And usually this is a good or bad. I mean, if you get like a seven uh, on a survey of one to 10, you know, that's not good. It's usually the, the relationship is really effective or it's not effective from the people I talk to about this. Um, you know, when it when it's okay, that's that's not good at all. Um, and and then they get to uh, are people happy with the program, the mentoring program? Um, you know, so they ask questions and try to get get into that. Um, you, you know, are you getting the? Were we giving you the right types of supports and connections and things like this? And then there's always the issue of when the entrepreneur is successful, why did that happen? And this is like a big you know, un unknown. I mean, you know, and I think we all struggle with this and even the donors I work with, like, of course, the entrepreneur's success is because of the entrepreneur. <coughs> and, you know, and, and, and what a, a mentor did or a training program or a connection, that's all contributed to it and will never, I think, you know, m maybe my grandchildren will figure out the algorithm to figure out whether we were you know, really helpful in all that, in that job creation number or other things we're trying to get to from an economic perspective. Um, so I think we're almost trusting the word of the entrepreneur and their perspective of what's happening. Um, you know, and and I think we're, the, the great thing is when I started to do this, we had no data. We were just guessing on how to help entrepreneurs. And because of what Gali and Endeavor Insights and Startup Genome and World Bank and all these things that are going on, we're starting to become a lot smarter of how to do this, and we're starting to look at data. And if you have an entrepreneurship program, it's so important for you to do this. The best programs I've met are very data focused. It's very data focused. Yeah, and I'll just back you up and say that you know people always come to me and want to know like what's the data on X Y Z, and there are certain things that are you can capture through you know quantitative data collection, but. It also matters a lot to just ask someone what their experience is. And yeah. I'm glad that you said that because I, I think people tend to undervalue that when it's actually incredibly valuable. Um, so we only have a little bit more time, and I, I kind of want to get into the peer learning uh, component because there's so many questions around mentorship because there's so much activity, so much interest, um, but it can be difficult to measure as we've established. But on the peer learning, I've seen so much evidence that this is effective. and. Rob, I want to turn to you and just say, like, as someone who, you know, village capital focuses so much on peer selection, and I'm assuming that, you know, comes in like peer learning has a lot to do with that. Um, why, from your experience, is that so valuable? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, um, I mean, I think that there's there's a number of uh, factors that play into that, and I, to be perfectly honest, I probably won't remember all of them, but um, there are a couple that really kind of stand out. One is, one is just being able to plug into people who are working on a similar problem in a similar market, um, and as a result, uh, are familiar with the challenges, with the players in the ecosystem, with the opportunities and the landscape. Um, the second is also being able to plug into folks with a uh, similar lived experience. Um, of the problem, who know kind of what might work and what might not work as far as solutions go. Um, on top of that, and, and somebody had actually asked this question in, in the chat box, um, we've also seen a lot of, from our programs at least, when you have this intensive peer engagement, um, we've seen a lot of collaboration that comes out of that. So we've seen um, participants in our cohort who have gone on to hire one another, merge with one another, acquire one another, 
um, because they've gotten such a good understanding of what each other is doing, how they might be able to combine forces or where they might be able to support one another, which I think is incredibly valuable. Um, and then ultimately, like as far as kind of actually making things like investment decisions or conducting due diligence, you've got, going back to that, that first point about having a, a deep knowledge of the market and so forth, you've got 10 to 12 people who are conducting that um, on a single business for each participant in the cohort, which uh, means you've got this multitude of very experienced perspectives with a deep familiarity of what's going on who are able to provide constructive feedback in a very structured way of, of um, the business. And so again, we use this very kind of um, wonky framework which has sort of 16 variables that the entrepreneurs use to assess one another. And um, they then have to sort of explain their reasons for their uh, evaluations and their assessments. Um, and when you kind of get that into the weeds, there's really, uh, you're really kind of, not necessarily eliminating, but certainly reducing the scope for that kind of fluffy communication of, oh, I think you'll uh, have the potential to scale or you'll have the potential to do well. And what is actually happening is the peers are giving each other very detailed and specific um, feedback in terms of where they can grow. Yeah. It's been interesting to me how many times I've interviewed entrepreneurs who said, you know, I thought that it would be like, you know, this type of networking or, you know, meeting investors that would be the most valuable part of my accelerator program. But really, I met this other entrepreneur who became my partner, <laughs> who became my supplier, like all these different, you know, connections. I found that really interesting. Can I just mention one thing on, on this, especially these accelerators that really focus in on creating these relationships between the cohorts and are not so virtual and there's like physical connections at a very often pace, there seems to create a culture among themselves. This is what I've noticed. And the good accelerators sort of extenuate that culture of like this is about now making it happen. Like there's there's an accountability and they all start to keep each other accountable somehow. This is just what I've noticed and I don't have any data on this. I'm sorry, but I've just seen there's a, there's a, there's a way to create a culture and and when you have good when people know they're going to be judged on what they do and how they act in executing it gets away from all the silliness of just evaluating ideas and it gets to can this person actually make it happen and i see those programs a lot more effective than the ones that are sort of more judgmental like really being able to connect um creating this pressure and culture where everybody feels like well so and so is working all night i should be doing this and then having people accountable to each other. Not that they're their bosses, but they feel like, well, I told so-and-so I'm going to get this done in a week. And this is going for mentoring, too. I feel accountable, like, I need to make that happen. And and it's built on this trust relationship, you know, like, you don't want to let people down. Again, it's not that they're, they're your boss, but it's this, as, as the entrepreneurs, you kind of do need a little bit more accountability because there's nobody you're accountable for. And so even if you make up, like, well, you know, I just talked to Pat. He's in my cohort. I told him I'm going to talk to 100 customers this week. You feel like, well, I don't want to let Pat down. And I see that a lot in this culture that you can create in these programs. Well, and one thing that I'd actually just um, kind of spitting off that as well, uh, flag up, is the fact that with this, with this notion of pure social capital, there's also there's an underlying empathy there because being an entrepreneur is not some, you know, incredibly fun wild ride that people get into just because they, they like the lifestyle of it. Because it's a it's a really challenging lifestyle. You have to sacrifice a lot and it's very lonely in many ways. And um, you know, you really have to put your all into to growing this business, which is not an easy thing to do. And when you're getting constructive feedback around your business from people who are sitting in that same spot who are also you know, um, trying to balance like families and relationships and, and bringing money in the door with this, um, you know, business that they're trying to scale. Um, that really creates that underlying bond of, or helps create that underlying bond of, of trust and relationship. Yeah, that's, you know, as someone who studies accelerators, that's one of the differentiating factors of what an accelerator is, that cohort model, the whole point of entrepreneurs going through this journey together. So yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. So I have one more question, which I really didn't want to miss because we've been talking about how programs can implement, you know, um, programming to support uh, the building of social capital, like mentorship programs or peer learning or whatnot. But there's been a, a question through the chat box, and I've had this question as well, in terms of how do you scale that, um, you know, how do you scale mentorship, how do you scale 
social capital to like a community or, or city level? Or is it kind of just you know, stuck within a program? Like, is there a chance for that to turn into organic growth for an entrepreneurial ecosystem? Yeah, and this is Anastasia uh, at USAID. If I can add to the question for, for any of our panelists, I think um, Glenn was asking that question, and I want to ask more pointedly, you know, especially in the cases where us as donors, it seems like we're, in some cases, because the system's broken, taking over either, either venture capital or what would be management consulting in a perfect market um, because something's broken <laughs> in these markets. How do we transition after the donor program, whatever it is, into where the system works on it on its own in a commercial fashion mm -hmm. and we don't okay. need to keep uh, intervening and subsidizing? Yeah, Mike, I'd like to hear. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. As far as the programming goes, it is hard to find a commercial model. I know a lot of people will always just look for these market-based models, and there's only so many successful 